I'm going to start reading James chapter 1, and I'm going to start reading from verse 1. It says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. That is the word of the Lord. And you know, as we open up this book, now we know um, that this letter was most likely written by, well, it was written by a guy called James, um, but it was written by James, the half-brother of Jesus, which is quite an amazing thing. You know, if, if, if you wanted to have a good readership, you know, have uh, lots of people come and read your letter, then put in James, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. That would be a pretty good opening, wouldn't it? You know, it's like, okay, so Jesus, he's ascended, he's not here anymore, but I can hear from his brother. What an amazing thing. But that's not how James begins his letter. He begins his letter, James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. As James opens up his letter, not, not just his letter, but the letter of the Holy Spirit, as he opens it up, he doesn't begin James, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't begin with um, what, in one sense, what he is naturally and what he's been able to do for himself. He begins with what God has done for him. He begins with, I, I'm James, this is who I am and my identity isn't that I'm naturally related to the Lord Jesus Christ, but my identity is that I've been bought, brought into his heavenly family, that I've been brought into relationship with him. Because James was in this really weird place. He was naturally related to the Lord Jesus, but without faith, he was no relation of the Lord Jesus. That James, he would have been one of those guys that when Jesus was sitting in the house and he was teaching and uh, the disciples came to Jesus and said, um, Master, your, your mother and your brothers and your sisters, they're standing outside. They want to see you. And Jesus replies in that instance and he says, these are my mother, my brother and my sisters, those who do, do the will of the Lord that there was a separation between James and the Lord Jesus because James had not yet responded in faith to his brother. But now that James had come and he'd found faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he was no longer big brother Jesus, but he was the Lord Jesus. He was coming not with his natural identity, but he was coming with what the Lord had done in his life. That, that I, I'm a bond servant. I'm, I'm one who is tied to the Lord Jesus and I've committed my life to him. You know, when we use that word bond servant, it's a really interesting thing because um, Israel, they, you, ha you had servants in the house, but you would come and basically you'd commit to serve in a particular house for a particular length of time. And then when you got to the end of your service, maybe it was seven years, maybe it was 10 years, maybe it was 15 years, you were then free to go. You, you'd, um, you'd, you know, you'd done your time, you'd done the time that you committed to that family, and then you'd go. But if you found it good to work in that master's household, if you found it an enjoyable place to be, maybe you'd got married and your family were living there and, and your master treated you well and it was a good home to be in, then you could go to your master and you could say, I, I want to be a bond servant of yours. And what they would do is they would take you to a lamppost, basically, um, to, um, a, or a wooden door frame, and they'd get um, a piece of metal and they'd pierce your ear against the door. And that would be a sign that you were now a bond servant of that house. Your life was committed to the service of that house. 
It was no longer I was committing just to serve that house for a couple of years, but until the day I die, I have committed to serve this house. And James, he was writing to the Jews, he was writing to the Jewish nation, he says he was writing to the 12 tribes scattered abroad all across the known world, and he says to them, guys, you're the ones who know the law, you're the ones who understand the history of our nation, I'm a bond servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not just committing to serve him because he's my big brother, but I found that he's a good master. I found that he, this is my home, this is where I live, and I've committed my life to serve him. If you were to write a letter, not that I'm saying you can write more scripture, scripture's done with the book of Revelation, but if you were to write a letter and it was to be weighed up, would your letter be able in honesty to begin whatever your name is, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you committed, this is my home. I found God, I found the Lord Jesus Christ to be a good master. And with my, not with my ear, but with my heart, I, I'm, I've tied myself to him. Because that's James's beginning place. That's not the place where he's heading, that's where he's beginning. He's saying, I've tied my life to God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the place I'm going from. See, sometimes, sometimes and it's, it's a false gospel, it's a false idea, that my goal is to get to the place where I've made enough commitments that now, I, now I'm fully committed to the Lord Jesus. Now I'm all in with the Lord Jesus. That's the beginning of the gospel. The beginning of the Gospel of Mark is, well, it says this is the beginning of the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. And it goes on, and Jesus is tempted in the wilderness, and then he calls the disciples. And what does he call them to do? He says, follow me. And their response is, and immediately they left their nets, and they followed him on the road. The beginning of the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is total lifelong commitment. That's why you can't have half-hearted Christianity. That's why you can't have part-time Christianity. That's why Sunday church attendance is not Christianity. Now, genuine Christianity should include Sunday church attendance because we gather together on the Lord's Day in, in, in celebration that He's risen from the dead. We, on, on Easter Sunday, that's not the only day uh, we celebrate the resurrection, but every single Sunday we celebrate that the Lord Jesus is risen from the dead. But there's no room for half-hearted Christianity because the beginning of the gospel is a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the beginning place. Total commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where he wants to take us from. Not, that's not where he wants to take us to, that's, in one sense, the minimum standard that the Lord Jesus demands. He says, total, lifelong commitment. That's what I'm asking of you at a base level. So if you were to write a letter, could yours begin a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ? Could yours begin... I've committed my life totally in service to this master who I found good, who I found faithful. Because that is repentance. You know, in the foundations group I do on a Wednesday, we've just been going through the sinfulness of sin. And sin outside of Christ is your master. You made a total lifelong commitment to serve in sin. However it looked like in your life, maybe you were um, a mass murderer at one end, or maybe you were a faithful tither and church attender at the other end, but with no faith. Sin was your master. You made a total, lifelong commitment to serve sin. 
You were bound to it, you were bound by it, and you didn't want to go any other place. Sin was your master outside of Christ. When we come to faith in Christ, you're changing who your lifelong master is. That's all you're doing. So you, you, you can't be sitting here right now saying, I am a free person, free to do exactly what I want, whenever I want, however I want. You're a master to something. You're a slave to something. Either you're bound to sin, and in one sense, you're perfectly free to sin however you want. But you're bound to sin. Sin is your master. Or you are a slave to God. You're a slave to righteousness. And you're perfectly free to live in righteousness and to live a saintly life however you want. But one of those two is going to be your lifelong master. Right now at this moment, one of those two is your lifelong master. Either sin and darkness and the devil or righteousness and the Lord Jesus Christ. The question is, have you, so to speak, put your ear on God's door and said, I found you to be a good master, and I'm committing my life to you. That's where James begins, and this is important because as he goes on, he then says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. You know, sometimes when we go through various trials, when we go through various situations, we kind of wonder, is God still good in this situation? Is God still good? And I'm not going to ask people to raise any hands, but I know you do it. Is God still good? Because we don't ask it, is God being good right now? We ask it, we make it a character question. Is God still good in general because of this little thing that I'm going through. But James begins his letter in saying, I'm a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He begins his letter by saying, I've already found him to be a good and faithful master. So when James is talking about going through these various trials, which I don't think James was exempt from, I mean, if, if um, uh, the, the traditional historical record is correct, James stayed in Jerusalem, was constantly persecuted for his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, was then thrown from the top of the temple, and when he didn't die, was beaten on the head with a club until he died. So I think James knows what it's like to go through various and difficult trials. <laughs> but those things weren't going to let his trust that God is a faithful and a good master be shaken. Because he'd already made that commitment. I know God is a faithful and a good master. Therefore, I'm committing myself to him as a bondservant. So when I go into these various trials, that's not even in question. Yeah. I'm not even letting myself ask, yeah. is God still good? Yeah. Yeah. Because he is. And if your emotions are saying God isn't, your emotions are wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Because in committing to him as a bondservant, you've already decided in your heart and you've already committed with your life yeah. that he is a faithful yeah. and a good master. Yeah. So in one sense, those questions, even if they come, they're entirely irrelevant because you can't go back on your promise anyway. You've already decided, not just with your mind, not just with your heart, not just with your emotions, but with your body, your whole life, that he is a faithful and a good master. So when you're going into these situations, it doesn't matter what anybody else says. It doesn't matter what your, uh, what your sister down the phone, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what she says. You've decided with your life that God is a faithful and a good master. So when you go into these trials, it's not even allowed to be a question. It's irrelevant. Because God says, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And I love what Chris Fallerton says at that. 
He says, all things work together for good. So if it's not yet good, God hasn't yet finished working. So stop getting in his way and walk with him. So if your letter was to begin, would it begin a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ? Because whether it does or not affects how you're going to handle those trials. If, if you haven't yet decided God is a faithful and a good master, then when you go into those various trials, now those things may still come anyway. But if you've already decided that God is a faithful and a good master, then you're not going to let them stay. You're not, going to, you're not going to give them the time of the day. You're not going to consider them. You know, I have so many, sorry, by the way, if this is you, I have so many messages on WhatsApp and on Facebook and stuff that I just don't respond to. If it's you, again, I'm terribly sorry. It's nothing personal. <laughs> but you can decide not to respond to those messages. Once, you know, the notification appears on my home screen, once I click clear, honestly, you might as well have not messaged. Um, you can decide to do that with those thoughts. Yeah. Click clear, it doesn't matter, it remains unread. It's no big deal. They'll just message it again if it's important. Just ignore it, clear away the message. Don't worry about it, ignore it. For those who have decided that God is a faithful and a good master, James calls you brethren, and he's writing this to you. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, because it doesn't always come across as fun to start off with. So he says, count it. He says, regard it as all joy. Regard it all joy. Say, yay, the car broke down the mo this morning. Maybe don't do that in the street. You know, people will think you're weird. But, you know, um, count it all joy. Consider it a good and joyful thing when you fall into various trials. Now, the thing he says here, he doesn't say the trials are joyful and a good thing. Because they're trials. They're not joyful and they're not necessarily good. But the thing that God wants to do in you and I, I emphasize the thing he wants to do in you. Sometimes we focus on what God wants to do through you. And God what does want to do amazing things through you in every aspect of your life. But here, he's not focusing on what God wants to do through you. Because how many of you know you can be used by God, but not necessarily changed by God? That's what happens on the extreme. Those who come to the Lord in the last day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do these things in your name? And the Lord responds, depart from me, I never knew you. God had done amazing things through them, but nothing amazing had happened in them. So we want to be those that wonderful things are happening uh, through us, but we also want to be those that wonderful things are happening in us. And as you go through a trial, the Lord wants to do something wonderful in you and that's what you're to consider it as joy not necessarily the trial the fact that the car broke down bit of a pain but what the Lord wants to teach you in that situation is a joyful and a wonderful thing so when you're going through those trials say thank you Lord that for what you're going to do in me thank thank you Lord for how you're going to change me and how is he going to change you he's going to produce patience he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. I think so many times when we read that, we read it, the testing of your faith produces victory. Okay, maybe you don't think that. Um, my assumption was that a lot of you thought that, um, it would, that you, you think count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces victory. Because we believe in a victorious God, do we not? God who is victorious over sin and grave. God who has conquered uh, the waters. You know, Psalm 91, 
you know, that blessed is the one who dwells in the shadow of the Most High. Why? Because he's a safe place. We believe in the God who is the mighty and the strong tower. And when my faith gets tested, I just prove out how victorious my God is. Amen? Amen. Amen. And that is true. But that's not what he's saying there. He says, when your faith gets tested, it will produce patience in you. Because it's not necessarily about whether the victory comes or not. The victory, in one sense, is not your decision. It's his. It's his power. It's his authority. It's his reign. The victory is on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the victorious one. The patience is on your side. Let's go back all the way to when Moses and the Israelites, you know, just a small crowd of about two million Israelites, they were walking out of Egypt and they get to the edge of the Red Sea. Um, I've never tried swimming with two million people. Um, but, and nor do I intend on doing that, but I don't imagine it would go very well, especially when you're trying to get your, your horse and cart across as well. They're not known for being fantastic swimmers. And they're standing on the edge, and there's a big water in the way, and behind them they have um, the slightly annoyed pharaoh who's coming to get his slaves back. And they're stuck. And what go does God tell them to do? Well, he tells Moses, go, raise your staff. But what does he tell them to do? He says, watch and see the salvation of the Lord. There were many in that congregation, many in that two million people, who they were believing that the Lord was bringing them out of the house of bondage into the house of freedom, into the promised land. That's what God promised their forefathers. That's what God promised the uh, father Abraham. This is what the Lord is doing right now. We have faith that the Lord is bringing us into freedom. And, you know, if, for those Pentecostals who were there at the time, they'd be going, hallelujah. Um, <laughs> And now they're on the edge, and their faith is being tested. They can't get through the water, and if the army get to them, they're all going to die. Their faith is being tested. Now God comes, God um, deals with the army by bringing the waters of the Red Sea crashing down on top of them. God brings the victory in that situation, but those who were believing that the Lord was bringing them out of the house of bondage into freedom, into the promised land, they had to wait. Watch and see the salvation of the Lord. That the testing of their faith produced patience and the Lord brought the victory. There are some things that sometimes they take a bit of time to work out. But as your faith is tested, do you really believe that the Lord will heal? What if it takes a bit of time? The Lord will bring the victory. And Jeremiah Johnson, a prophet who we went to see um, in Glasgow, he, he said, the Lord... We're, we're, we're contesting for the victory of the Lord right now that we want to see it here, but Either way, in the last day, the Lord will have his victory because the Lord is victorious. But as you're waiting, as you're waiting in faith, as your faith is being tested, do you really believe the Lord will do this? Do you really believe the Lord will heal? Do you really believe the Lord will restore? Do you really believe that the Lord will move in this way? I mean, come on. We've been waiting since 1904. The Lord will have his victory. Yes. Amen. But will you have your patience? Will you learn to wait on the Lord? And as you're waiting on the Lord, you're not sitting back passively. 
you're, 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 you're um, pleading to him, you're, you're interceding, you're praying, you're, you're trusting that the Lord, you're actively trusting that the Lord will continue to move. So it's not a passive waiting. It's not a passive patience. But it is still waiting. It is still patience. The Lord will have his victory, but will you learn to be patient in faith? Will you learn to wait on the Lord? Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why should you count it all joy when you fall into various trials? Because you know that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing i think there's just something about that when you've learned to be patient when you've learned that i may not have it right now but i know the lord is going to come through then you can walk in a place of i lack nothing because even if i don't have it right now and even if i ask and it doesn't come right now i i i know the lord still answers Think of Daniel, the prophet Daniel. He, he was asking the Lord to move on behalf of the whole nation who were in captivity in Babylon. He prayed and he fasted. He prayed and he fasted. He prayed and he fasted. And then three weeks later, an angel finally arrives, basically says, sorry I'm late, was held up in heaven uh, in a heavenly war. I act- the Lord actually aunt, um, heard your prayer three weeks ago but it's just taken me this long to get to you. As you pray and you wait, as you pray and you wait, in faith, do I have the answer right now? No, but I know the Lord. I know the Lord. I know He is the all-sufficient one. I know He lacks nothing, and as I'm walking in His will, I lack nothing. I know as He's with me, Or rather, as I'm with him, because there's a difference, isn't it? You know, um, Joshua, when he's uh, about to go and uh, face down Jericho, he comes and he stands before the commander of the Lord's armies and he says, "Are are, are you with us or are you with our enemies? And the commander of the Lord's armies turns around to him and says, no, the real question is, are you with me? Are you with the Lord? That it's not, is the Lord on my side, it's, am I on the Lord's side? So as I'm standing in faith, and as I'm patiently waiting, I know the Lord lacks nothing. There's two things, well really there's three commands that he gives us in this passage. The first one was, count it all joy. He says it as a a command, count it all joy. Regard it as joy when you fall into various trials. Because the testing of your faith will produce patience. He then says, but let that patience have its perfect work. And I believe that perfect work is that you come to that place where it doesn't matter whether I have the answer right now. I know it's coming because I know I'm walking with the Lord. Because he's already proven himself to be a faithful and a good master. So I'm not fretting about if it's coming or not. I'm not questioning his goodness. I'm not questioning his sufficiency. I'm not questioning his willingness. I'm not wondering if he's given me the silent treatment. Because I know the Lord answers. I know he'll answer. I know he'll meet me. Count it all joy. Let patience have its perfect work. And the result of that perfect work is that you will be perfect and complete. You will lack nothing. Why? Because you're walking with the Lord. You know he's your good and faithful master. You know he's the one who is with you. And then he goes on and he says, But if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God. He says, if patience has its perfect work, you'll be perfect and complete, and you'll lack nothing. 
That you, in the Lord, you have everything you stand in need of. He is the all-sufficient one. He always was the all-sufficient one. He's proving himself. He always is the all-sufficient one. And he's saying he always will be the all-sufficient one. But he says very specifically, because the Lord says, you'll be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And then he gives this one command that if you're lacking this one thing, ask. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, ask of God. Because we need wisdom in pretty much every situation of life. Do I take the medicine? Do I not? Do I get, take this job? Do I not? How do I handle my children when they're being pains? What do I do in this situation? Sometimes we think, well, I can decide it myself in this situation, but when it's a really big decision, then, then I'll have to make a decision. Then I'll have to ask God for help. But the thing is with that is that means your experience and your need for God is relative to where you are. For example, um, if, you know, if you're a young child and you're saying, well, a large amount of money, if, I, if I'm trying to decide how to spend a large amount of money, like 10 pounds, then I need God's wisdom. But then if you ask a billionaire, they're like, no, 10 pounds? Like, I wouldn't even notice if that fell out of my wallet. Like, but if it's a billion pounds, then I'll need wisdom. But God's supply of wisdom is not dependent upon you. God's supply of wisdom is dependent upon himself. He says to us, don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, in all your ways, whether it's a decision you're making at school, whether it's how do I respond to my friend? How do I handle myself in work? How do I handle myself with my wife? Like, what do I do? He says, if any of you lack wisdom, ask. That's the third command. He says, count it all joy. Let patience have its perfect work and ask God if you lack wisdom. Why? Because God is the one who gives to all. All those who are his bondservants. All those who have found him to be a good and faithful master. He gives to all of them wisdom. And how does he give it? He says, first of all, he gives it liberally. He gives it liberally. It's, it's, you know, he, he, he'll, he'll, just, he'll throw it out. He'll throw it out. He's not, there's yours. There's yours. There, oops, sorry. There's yours. He says he'll give it liberally. He's, he's lavish with his distribution of wisdom. He, he'll just give it out to you. Ask him, and he's like, yeah. Just take it. He says he'll give it without reproach. He's not like, well, last time you didn't really use my wisdom very well. Now, if you were in a situation and you asked the Lord for wisdom and he gave it and you then didn't use it and things um, didn't go well, then you need to go back to him and say, Lord, I'm sorry for not listening to you. But don't let that hold you back from asking again because the Lord gives liberally and he gives without reproach. He'll give you his wisdom. In fact, I'd say he wants to give you his wisdom because he's the one who's telling you to ask in the first place. So he's saying, if you're lacking wisdom, ask me and I will give it to you. He's not going to then turn around when you ask him and go, mm, I don't know. No, he's, he's telling you to ask him because he wants to give you his wisdom because he wants things to go well for you. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, ask God. He's the one who gives to all liberally and without reproach. He says, ask him and it will be given. But the one thing he does say is he says, ask in faith. Ask in faith. So when you're coming to him, you're not going, God, I'm asking you for wisdom, and if you give it, then that would be great, but if not, I'm going to do this other thing. Um, because that's not asking in faith, that's being double-minded. And he specifically says, don't be double-minded about this, because you'll be like a boat, tossed to and fro, going back and forth in the waves. Like, you, you don't want to live your life like that, you'll get sick. 
right? Um, <laughs> he says, ask in faith. Why? Because it goes back to what it says at the beginning of the book, a bond servant. You already know he is a faithful and a good master. One of the things that they were told in the Old Testament, commit yourself as a bond servant to these people if they provide for you. If they're taking care of you and your family, that's one of the signs that you can commit to them as a bond servant. So if you've already made that decision that I'm committing to God and the Lord Jesus Christ as a bond servant, then you've already said that he's a good and a faithful master. You've already said he's taking care of me and my family. So when you're coming to him and you're asking for wisdom, why wouldn't you come in faith? Why wouldn't you come expecting him to supply? Why wouldn't you come expecting him to meet your need? Why wouldn't you come expecting that he's going to give you exactly what you need when you need it? He's a faithful and a good master who's proven himself to care for you. So take him at his word, trust his wisdom, and walk it out. He says, brethren, count it all joy. Regard it as joy when you fall into those various trials. They may not look the same for everybody, but you'll know when they come. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Second thing, let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. But if you do lack wisdom, ask of God. He's the one who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him, the one who asks. But let him ask in faith, with no doubt in, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man and stable in all his ways. I say that's the one time the Lord says he won't grant wisdom. Is if you're double-minded. Because the Lord grants it liberally, but he still says it's precious. He's willing to give you it as much as you need, even at more than, like just an abundant amount of wisdom in your life. But just because it's abundant doesn't mean it's not precious. When the Lord grants a gift, no matter how much of it he gives, it's, it's still from the Lord. It's still precious. So when you receive wisdom from the Lord, you're like, oh, the Lord gave me wisdom half an hour ago. In fact, the Lord gave me wisdom yesterday too. In fact, he gave it to me last week. I'm rolling in his wisdom. It's still precious. It's still a precious gift from the Lord. So don't regard it lightly. Know that you'll receive it abundantly, but don't regard it as lightly because it's still the Lord speaking to you. And you know, the way the Lord speaks to you, you're like, Lord, would you please help me in this situation? And you're like, right, okay, I know what to do. And then you go and do it. That was impossible before Jesus came. For our brothers and sisters who lived before the cross, if you missed the word of the prophet, you missed the word of the Lord. It was that simple. If you didn't listen to the prophet, that was it. But because he's poured out his spirit on all flesh and all those who believe, you can now hear from the Lord yourself. And he'll give it to you abundantly. There's no situation too big or too small. Think about it. King Saul, before he was uh, King Saul, he was just Saul. And uh, he lost his donkeys. Terrible situation, I know. Um, so he goes to the prophet to ask him, where do I find my donkeys? Like, you would think, like... I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, you know, like, go into the prophet to ask where my donkeys are. And that's a strange thing. I would just pray. But, you, but they lived before the cross. They didn't have access like that. They had to go to the prophet. But you're like, do I really want to bother a prophet about some donkeys? Do I really want to bother the Lord about my job? Do I really want to bother the Lord about my family? Do I really want to bother about my family? That wasn't a question for me. Maybe that was in some of your hearts. 
he went to see the prophet Samuel about some donkeys, and it changed his life. And for those of you who know the story, you know what happened. Nothing's too small to go to the Lord on those things. You never know. Going to the Lord on those things might change your life too. But it's a command. He says, if you found him to be a good and faithful master, then these are commands. These aren't suggestions. If you found him to be a good and faithful master, and you've committed yourself to him as a bondservant, then when you fall into various trials, count it all joy, because the testing of your faith will produce patience. Let that patience have its perfect work in your life, and you'll be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And when you do lack wisdom, because you will, ask. And he'll give it to you abundantly. He'll give it to you liberally. He won't hold back. But make sure you ask in faith. Because although it's abundant, it's still a precious gift from the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, if you haven't found him to be a faithful uh, and good master yet, then he has another command to you. And he says, repent. He says, he is a good and faithful master. He is a good and faithful master. It's not an optional experience. It's who he is. And he's never wrong. So you need to change your mind. You need to turn around your mind, turn around your actions, set your eyes on him, and run after him. Let him bind you to himself for your whole life. Let the work of the cross be real and apparent in your life. You respond to him. You say, Lord Jesus, you're the one who died. You're the one who rose. And I bind myself to you. I commit myself to you because you're a good and faithful master. And then walk in his joy. Walk in his wisdom. And let him move in wonderful ways in your life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I, I thank you that you are the good and faithful master. Thank you, you're the one that never fails. You're the one who never runs out of resources. You're the one who never runs out of wisdom. And Lord Jesus, my trust is in you. Even for this message, Lord, you know my trust was in you. Lord, I pray that we will be those who would walk in obedience to your command, Lord, that we would be those who counted us joy when we fall into various trials. So help us to recognize when those trials come, Lord, because we want to count them as joy. Lord Jesus, help us, Lord, that we would be those, Lord, that as our faith is tested, Lord, we would pass the test. And Lord Jesus, patience would be produced. Lord, that we would be those that would let patience have its perfect work in our lives, Lord, that in trusting in you, Lord, in knowing you have it and you have us, Lord, that we would be perfect and complete and lacking nothing, Lord. And when we need wisdom, and so often we do, Lord Jesus, we'd call upon your name and find you faithful and abundantly giving wisdom. Lord, that we thank you it's so abundant, we thank you it's so lavish. But Lord Jesus, I still want to treasure your wisdom. <laughs> and take care to walk in it. Lord, I thank you for our time together. Thank you for our time in your word. Lord, I just pray you'd sink these things into our hearts and into our minds, Lord, that having heard them, Lord, we wouldn't just walk out and forget them, but Lord Jesus, we'd be transformed by them and walk more closely with you. In Jesus' name, amen.